Imagine a world in which the human brain was directly connected to artificial intelligence technology via a neurochip. Such technology would potentially open the door to near superpowers, but it may raise serious concerns. On the other hand, you would have seemingly infinite memory, direct access to colossal databases of information on the internet, and something approaching digital immortality. But on the other hand, you've got things like access to sensitive data, fake news, living in what is essentially an illusion, and perhaps even the loss of independent thought altogether. So which of these is actually possible? What is Neuralink technology capable of? And what are its limitations? What is the true extent of the progress of Elon Musk's Neuralink and its competitors? Let's break it down in this episode. Watch to the end, it's gonna be interesting. Hi everyone, my name is David and I'm the host of the Pro Robots channel. Now, I'll start today's video in the only logical place and that's with 19th century German psychiatrist, Hans Berger. During military training in 1892, he was almost trampled under the hooves of a military horse and run over by the artillery battery that it was towing. At that moment, so the story goes, his sister suddenly sensed that something terrible was happening to her brother and sent him an urgent telegram. This coincidence was later called by Berger a case of spontaneous telepathy and prompted the scientist to devote his further research to brain activity and its effect on other people. Now, needless to say, it wasn't possible to prove telepathy, of course, but in the process, a method of measuring brain activity was invented, which we still use today, the encephalogram. Almost 100 years later, this invention has inspired many scientists to create brain-computer interfaces. Broadly speaking, today there are two types of brain-computer interfaces, wearable devices and implantable devices. To understand the difference between the two, imagine a sports stadium during an intense game. Wearable devices are akin to standing outside the stadium and hearing the roar of the crowd, but not being able to see how the game itself is playing out. And implantable ones are when you're sitting in the stands and see and hear everything that's going on, both the action on the pitch and the many conversations of individuals around you. Each approach has its pros and cons. The first one doesn't require you to have your skull drilled, which I'm sure you'll agree is a big plus. On the other hand, such interfaces have limited ability to pick up signals from your brain. The second one, implantable devices, involves connecting directly to the brain and has the future potential to give users what might look like superpowers to us now. And it's this category which includes Elon Musk's Neuralink chip. By the way, I'll go right ahead and say it, it's not quite as good as the entrepreneur says it is, but we'll get to that a bit later. So in this video, we'll concentrate on implantable devices since their potential is arguably a lot higher. So how exactly do they work? Our brains are made up of billions of neurons that communicate through chemical signals called neurotransmitters. The reactions generate an electric field that can be captured and recorded. These signals form the basis of our thoughts, memories, and actions. And a neurochip is a bioelectronic device that can record, analyze, and control these signals. The components of the device usually include electrodes, a chip, and a communication module. The electrodes make direct contact with the nerve tissue, allowing the device to monitor and stimulate neurons. The chip converts the recorded signal into an algorithm that the machine can understand. And a communication module allows this information to be exchanged with external devices. Today, neurochips are often used in medicine. The four main areas of development include restoring mobility to paralyzed limbs, controlling machines, controlling neuroprostheses of lost limbs, as well as detecting and suppressing abnormal brain activity in epilepsy, Parkinson's, and many other neurological diseases. All of these areas are still very much in development, but the technology's potential extends far beyond them. First, you have communication without the use of speech or writing. This includes communicating directly with another person's brain and controlling smart machines. Second, improving cognitive functions, such as memory and the general ability to know and learn. This, by the way, may make humans more competitive with machines, adding to our creative abilities and out-of-the-box thinking. The clear advantage artificial intelligence has over humans is its ability to learn quickly and process large amounts of data. So you can imagine how an implanted chip might reduce that gap a little, so to speak. Moving on, the third use of neurochips is for entertainment and games, specifically the instantaneous response of virtual and augmented reality to your thoughts and actions. This could also extend to various forms of art where AI 
can help people find new forms of self-expression. Further development could lead, as Ray Kurzweil and Elon Musk believe, for example, to the transfer of consciousness into machines and some kind of digital immortality. Is it possible? I tend to think that to understand the future, you have to look at history. And despite the fact that the history of neural interfaces is more than 50 years old, progress in this field is moving relatively slowly. Last century, back in the 60s, there were studies and performances based on this technology. The great interest in them now is not entirely due to a breakthrough in technology. It's probably more down to the star power of Elon Musk. In fact, despite the fact that researchers began to use relatively new machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies in their developments, there hasn't really been a great leap in the development of neurochips. Ten years ago, at the John Donahue Laboratory in the United States, scientists trained a woman paralyzed below the neck to accurately control a robotic arm. This became possible only after many months of hard training, so it wasn't widely used back then. And so far, 10 years later, virtually nothing has changed. That's why a number of experts today believe that in the next 10 years, the breakthrough will probably not happen either, and even Musk won't be able to make it. There are several reasons for this, and we'll take a look at them soon. There are other opinions too, of course. For example, we can't ignore the fact that technology for recording brain activity is developing rapidly. Electrodes are getting smaller and smaller, and in the future, scientists hope to use microparticles and nanoparticles to record brain activity. This leads a number of experts to believe that neural interfaces in the future will add functions to our brains, such as fast counting or processing other data. However, an unexpected problem may arise here. Let us imagine that neural interfaces have become available to ordinary people, and that the technology of implanting them has become as fast, easy, and safe as Elon Musk promises. And that seems more than likely. What do you think? What will most people start using neural interfaces that combine the brain and the computer for? In his book, The Physics of Star Trek, Lawrence Krauss claimed that something like Star Trek's concept of the holodeck, which is a room in which the user can navigate and interact with an entirely fictional 3D world and essentially live out any fantasy they could wish for, would in real life be much more addictive to humans than the TV show portrayed. On the other hand, Robert Nosick, with his experience machine thought experiment, seemed to critique the idea that humans would opt for a constant source of computer-generated pleasure. So, tell us your views in the comments. What do you think? Moving on, how's Neuralink doing right now? Well, basically, Musk hasn't really invented anything new, but he has been able to improve the technology significantly. For example, he created a compact device that might not even be visible on your head. And in addition, it doesn't need wires running through the skin, which reduces the risk of infection at the implantation site. His company has also developed the thinnest flexible wires and a robot that can quickly and very precisely implant them into the living brain. To achieve such a result, the Neuralink team had to solve a number of problems. For example, they had to create thin filaments made of thin films and polymers that are compatible with brain tissue and not subject to corrosion and also to develop innovative methods of assembly and sealing of each device component to make the chip made of biocompatible materials completely leak-proof. This reduces its size and ensures long-term trouble-free operation. You can see all the details of the technology in the video at the link in the description. Since then, unfortunately, the company's progress has pretty much stood still. There's still no commercial product and human testing has not been allowed at the company. Moreover, the speed at which Musk is forcing scientists to work at Neuralink has allegedly led to increased mortality in animals being tested. And this has led to an investigation of the company by the relevant authorities in the United States. In addition, the company has suspiciously few scientific papers, which also causes skepticism in the scientific community. Much of the faith in the success of Neuralink rests entirely on the unique personality of Elon Musk himself, who has already been able to prove that he can implement his ideas. At the same time, the chip may remain applicable only for medical purposes, since, for all his other statements and promises, the technology is clearly not yet ready. It's likely that such things as transferring consciousness into a computer will prove impossible for our generation or even for the next. But what about more realistic targets? Well, Neuralink's competitors are already actively working here. The potential of the technology, which interested Musk in the first place, is keeping some other tech leaders awake at night. For example, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos invested large sums in Neuralink's competitor, Synchron. Unlike Neuralink, Synchron has already received permission to be tested on humans and has installed its implants into seven patients in the US and Australia. 
However, the difference between the brain computer interfaces of these companies is enormous. Synchron uses mesh Stentro devices. Now, a Stentrode is a portmanteau of stent and electrode. And these are fed to the brain through the jugular vein. The technology is similar to that used in pacemakers. It's simple, long known, and recognized as safe. However, it's not the same as a neurochip in the brain. The electrodes of the Synchron implants are quite far away from the neurons of the brain, and therefore the quality and information content of the signals they pick up is quite poor. To compensate for this, the implant is supplemented with an external gaze tracking system. In fact, this is responsible for most of the interaction between the person and the computer. As a result, sooner or later, neurochips and neural interfaces will definitely progress. And given that the development of technology is increasing exponentially, the future may indeed surprise us. And here, it's important to understand not only the benefits, but also the risks. For example, when neurochips are able to read brain activity and decode it, they'll have unprecedented access to our thoughts. And if the chip can send signals to control the movements of our arms or legs, where's the guarantee that it will not also affect our free will? It turns out that the field of neurointerfaces needs regulation. This includes the fact that it's of interest, for example, to the military. And we're talking not only about controlling machines with the power of thought, but also about the possibility to influence the brain in a certain way. For example, to disable the sense of fear or the instinct for self-preservation. That may not even be the worst of it. Already now, the scientific community has evidence that brain-computer interface devices can cause cognitive changes in the human brain that go beyond their intended use. For example, there have been documented cases in which chips have altered people's identities or contributed to preconceptions about their own abilities. For example, one elderly woman is said to have tried to lift a pool table, being fully confident that she could do it. And there's also the risk of becoming dependent on artificial intelligence and losing the ability to analyze facts and make decisions. In short, connecting the human brain to artificial intelligence technology via a neurochip could lead to a new era of humanity. But this technology still has a very long way to go and people will have to create a separate set of laws and rules for their application. So will there actually be a demand for them? Will the fascination for neuro interfaces simply pass like any other fad, stalling their development for another 50 years or so? Only time will tell. It's quite possible that connecting the brain to a machine will remain in demand exclusively in the medical field. Because the safety and usefulness of such interaction with machines for healthy people has yet to be proven. What do you think? What does the future hold for neuro interfaces?